This night started in the city but ended up deep in the woods. I wanted to put that out there not to break any rules of this sub. This is true and I will obscure the locations for personal safety and I apologize for the length. I'm originally from the northeast but I couldn't stand the winter so I went south for college. I was enrolled in my first year of university in the southern part of the US. The university was in a small city town and going out to drink was the main thing that everyone did. I was out with some other guys, playing pool at a small dive bar. An older guy came up and started talking to us, asked if he could get in on the game. I'll refer to him as Brian. I was 22 then, and he looked a bit older, probably in his late 30s. We played a few games, and he commented about a bonfire party happening just outside of town. He mentioned that there were some girls he worked with hosting it, and asked if we wanted to go. My friends declined, but I was single, so I said sure. As we left the parking lot in his truck, he said he needed to swing by his apartment and grab some liquor. This is when things got a little weird. I remember getting in the car and pulling out of the parking lot and then pulling up into an apartment complex on the outskirts of town. The bar was in the downtown area, and we were far away now on the outskirts. I wondered if I nodded off on the ride because I don't even remember the drive. I started questioning myself when he said that he would go inside, get the booze, take a shower, and then change his clothes. He offered for me to come inside too. The inside of his apartment was empty. No furniture, nothing was hanging on the walls, just open and empty rooms. He didn't say anything about it so I asked if he had just moved in. He said yeah and then walked back to the bathroom without saying anything else. I thought about just leaving when I heard him get in the shower. Something about the situation was just starting to creep me out. I was sizing him up in my head, thought I could take him if some weird shit went down. I remember him mentioning the girls in the bonfire so I decided to hang around and see where the night went. The shower stopped, he walked out wearing different clothes a few minutes later. He had two bottles of whiskey and he looked at me and said, ready? We jumped back in his truck and pulled out. I made a conscious effort to stay awake and alert. We left the city limits and headed outside of town on a dark back road. We were still on a main road, but were far from town now, and the closest city that I knew of was an hour away in the opposite direction. There were fewer and fewer houses as we drove. The places I could see looked like decrepit old shacks. I had lived here for a couple of months, but I've never been out this way. We continued to drive for a while, and I asked a few times if he knew where he was going. This was the middle of nowhere now. I didn't see any houses, and it was just thick woods on each side of the road. I didn't see him reading off any directions or anything. I saw a small parking lot with a gas station and a turnoff. A lone street light lit the gas station. Two pumps, and they both looked ancient. And a red neon sign saying 24 hours. The building was a double wide trailer converted into a store. We turned off onto the side street and kept going. This road was even worse than the main road we were just on. There were no street lights and it was very narrow. It twisted and turned, snaking through the woods. Still no houses visible, but I would see an old mailbox every once in a while. We came to the top of the hill and there was a driveway. I asked again if he knew where he was going and he just chuckled. I was in the middle of nowhere, surrounded by woods with some dude I didn't know. Fear did start to creep in. It wasn't at a house, it was more like a garage or industrial building. There were no lights inside or around it, and no motion lights as we drove up. No other cars or people. Where's the bonfire? I made my tone sound direct as possible. He just said, back through the woods. We drove past the building, around the back toward the woods. As we got closer, I could see a small path, and as we went through, branches scraped alongside the truck. After what seemed like forever, the trail opened up into a clearing. I could see a few other trucks and people. Relief washed over me. I grew up in a city and wasn't used to shit like this. I started to think I was just being uptight and I needed to chill out. It was past midnight and we left the bar around 10, so it felt good to finally get out of the truck. I scanned the group of people, but could only see a few girls. 
A couple of guys were building a fire trying to get it going. There were maybe 25 to 30 people there. A guy who was introduced as Mike walked up to us and to greet Brian, but he was staring at me the whole time. He never once stopped staring at me. Brian said he needed to take a piss and walked off. And Mike asked if I wanted a beer. He said to hang tight and walked away. Came back moments later and handed me an open bottle. I said thanks and started to make small talk, but he just turned and walked away. I started to look around and something just seemed off. There was no music playing, no lights, no liveliness to the conversation. The people at this party seemed diverse in age. I was wondering how they even knew each other because no one was talking. They were all just standing together in small groups and mumbling. Each time I approached a group of people, they would all stop talking and just stare at me. It was very standoffish and extremely uncomfortable. I just found myself standing alone and looking around for Brian. Couldn't see him anywhere. I looked around his truck but didn't see. By this time, I've had enough of this weird shit and was ready to go. I kept scanning around looking for his truck but it wasn't there. I didn't hear any vehicle start up or come and go while I was walking around. I turned back towards the bonfire and saw everyone was now looking at me together. All 30 or so people were now in one grouping, and they just stood there, no talking or movement. They were just standing completely still and staring at me. The bonfire glowed behind the group, making the moment feel very surreal. I stood there awkwardly and started noticing that their faces were changing. Their expressions rapidly changed from smiling to frowning, eyes wide to snarling grimaces. But as I focused on one of them, to see if that was what was really happening. The face would appear blank and expressionless. Suddenly one of the men started walking toward me with a deliberate pace and I turned and just ran. I ran up the path out of the clearing as fast as I could. My adrenaline was surging and I kept running. I couldn't hear anyone coming up behind me or any vehicles, but I knew I could not stop and needed to put as much distance as possible between them and me. I started to panic as the trail broke off and went different ways. Didn't remember that from driving in. I just kept running. Finally, I saw the building through the trees and felt some sort of relief. I stopped just before the edge of the trail. It was late fall and brisk, but I was burning up. I was wearing a flannel and jeans with boots. Not very good for running. I was sweating like a pig and I needed to catch my breath. Couldn't hear anyone coming up behind me on the path or still hear any vehicles in the distance. And the light from the bonfire wasn't visible anymore through the thick woods. As I crossed the lot and passed the industrial building toward the paved road, the lights came on inside. A second wind of adrenaline took hold and I ran towards the paved road and just kept running. My feet felt like lead and my legs burned but I kept running as long as I possibly could. Finally got tired and moved off the paved road into the bush to hide and catch my breath. I didn't see any headlights still, so I went back to the side of the road and began jogging. I was on high alert and kept glancing behind me, but never saw anything. I reached the end of the road, which connected back to the main road and that gas station. I went inside, and an old guy sat at the counter watching a small TV, and he asked if I was alright. I told him I needed to use the phone. He laughed and said, where'd you come from? I was out at a party and got ditched. He laughed a little and then gestured toward the phone on the wall. I could see he had a gun on his hip and probably thought I was a tweaker come to rob him. There was a phone book by the phone. I called a taxi to come pick me up. An hour later, I was back in my dorm and went to sleep. I never saw Brian again. I drove past his apartment complex but never saw his truck parked there. I never saw it around town or back at that same bar either. I'll never forget it, it was an off-white single cab Chevy, a late 80s model with a skull sticker on the back window with Roman numerals on the forehead. My curiosity got the best of me a few times. I drove toward the small gas station, followed the road to where the shop was and found it. I drove out there a couple of times, and each time there was no one there, and no cars in the lot. The building looked even shittier in the daytime. I left and drove back to town. This happened in the fall of 2004. I still get creeped out by it.
This happened in October of 2021. I've lived in North Alabama my entire life, save for living in Mississippi when I had college classes. I'm a girl, but I've always been a sort of son to my parents, especially my dad. He had raised me hunting and fishing every chance we could get. He taught me how to walk quietly in the woods, how to stop every few steps to look around and listen to the woods and your surroundings. You'd think that with his background, I'd be pretty comfortable spending my time in wooded areas or just in rural outdoor areas in general. For the most part, I am. However, I get really intense paranoia when I'm in the woods after dark and I never venture out without a firearm. After this experience, I'll never again question my preservation instincts. The night of my last birthday, my boyfriend surprised me with a little trip to a secluded riverbank, where he and I had gone hammocking before, as well as where my dad and I had spent many fishing excursions. He pulled into the boat ramp parking lot, turning into a smaller side road, and parked his truck with the tailgate facing the river and the hood right against the tree line. It was about 8 p.m. then, so it was already dark out, which put me on edge just a little bit upon arriving at the riverbank. I tried not to get too scared, though, and I focused on enjoying the evening my boyfriend had set up for us. He came prepared with an endless supply of goodies for me, slice of cake, my favorite candy, soda, cheesecake, and he even blew up an air mattress for us to lay on in the bed of his truck. We stayed there listening to music, talking and enjoying each other's company for about half an hour before a cop rolled into the parking lot. Knowing we weren't doing anything wrong, we didn't even have alcohol or anything of the sort, we exchanged small talk with the cop when he came to see what we were doing. Well, this is new, he said at first, referring to a couple of teenagers on an air mattress in a truck bed on the riverbank at night. We laughed a bit with him, acknowledging that the situation probably seemed a little odd. But after some general exchanges with the cop, he ended the conversation with, All right, then, y'all be careful out here. Some crazy crap's been going on lately. Don't want y'all to get caught up in anything. We gave him a brief, Yes, sir, will do, as he got back in his car and pulled out of the parking lot. At this point, we had stuffed ourselves with cake and various other goodies, so we decided to just lie down together and look at the stars. A bit of time passed as we did so, and I'd become entirely at ease with being out there in the dark. I trusted my boyfriend. He's had a few more intense encounters than I have with wildlife and just generally creepy situations in rural areas, so I felt safe with him. That was until twigs snapped from within the tree line that the hood of the truck was butted right up against. I shut up mid-sentence when I heard it. My boyfriend and I lay there still and silent while we waited to hear the noise again. Now I've heard my share of animals in the woods, and I also know the general mannerisms of the animals we have in that area. For instance, I'd heard packs of coyotes howling along that same riverbank before, but I didn't think one lone coyote would venture so close to us with our music and lights from the truck. We don't have any large predators either. The occasional bobcat would come around, but they tended to be pretty shy, and any cat would definitely make sure to be completely silent when approaching something they weren't sure about. Some rustling went on from the same direction as the original twig snap, and I whispered to my boyfriend, almost inaudibly, What was that? He briefly put a hand over my mouth, a gesture telling me not to make a sound, which put my heart rate through the roof. We lay there, listening to what sounded like footsteps heading toward the parking lot along the tree line. This absolutely freaked me out. Whatever it was, be it a regular animal or something else, it was very close to us, and we were lying out in the open. These sounds traveled out of earshot, but we remained still and quiet for a bit longer, to make sure whatever it was had gone far enough away from us for us to safely move around without imminent threat. I was close to tears by then, anxiously suggesting to my boyfriend that we should pack it up and leave, 
while he insisted that we would probably be fine staying a little longer. I felt awful about wanting to cut our night short, because his birthday surprise for me was really sweet, but my gut just was not having it. Reluctantly, he gave in to my suggestion of leaving. We packed everything back into the truck, me constantly looking around and listening every minute or so, until the only thing left to take was the air mattress. I'd leaned up against the side of the truck bed as he hooked up the pump to take the air out, when a goose called out from the riverbank about ten yards from us. Not thinking much of it, we continued packing up, until we heard a more frantic goose call. And my boyfriend jumped out of the truck with a hasty, That goose is being attacked. Get in the truck. He didn't have to tell me twice. From inside the closed vehicle doors, we listened as this goose on the bank screamed out several more times before being cut off mid-scream, having been finally killed. I was terrified at the moment. I couldn't make sense of why any normal animal would be so bold as to approach our vehicle, then actively kill another animal within a short distance of us. This thing didn't seem to have any fear. Sitting in silent panic as my boyfriend rubbed my arm to comfort me, he never got scared in situations like that, we allowed some time to pass before he said he would go back out and finish taking care of the air mattress. I was scared for him, imagining all kinds of scenarios where he could be attacked by something as I sat in the truck. I knew he had to get everything situated so we could drive away, though, so I watched through the back window and even cracked my door to keep an eye on him. Soon he finished with the air mattress, and he just sat it in the back seat. That's when a huffing sound came from the bank where we'd heard the goose dying. My adrenaline went insane then. I called out to him urgently and semi-quietly to get his butt back in the truck. But instead, he pulled out his flashlight and shined it along the bank, walking slowly in that direction. That idiot, I was thinking. I'd rather not sit here and witness his brutal death by some animal or thing, whatever it is. He stepped toward the parking lot, still shining the light down the bank. Then he stopped, and he said, I see it. He spoke so calmly. I urged him again to get back to the truck, which this time he finally listened. Once he was in the truck with the door shut, I asked him what it was. Was it a coyote? A cougar? He cocked his head. Ah, uh, no. No, neither of those. It was dark and low to the ground, and pretty big, too. That made up my mind. I told him to drive us out of there that instant, and he obliged. I never saw the thing he described, and I'm glad I didn't. My boyfriend has always internalized any fear or strong emotion, so I don't think his mild reaction to the encounter was phony. Later on, he admitted to me that he acted that way so I wouldn't get any more scared than I already was. I have no idea what it was that was lurking around us that night, but I'm grateful my birthday evening didn't turn out morbid. When I was 13... The dawning of the new millennium took place on New Year's Eve. While people were fearing for the worst with the Y2K bug, or out partying and drinking, I was home alone. In 1996, my parents had split up, and from there they divorced. My mother and I moved across the country from Oregon to Tennessee with her best friend. On the eve of the year 2000, I was home alone, and my mother was currently out of state. Now, this didn't worry me, as it was not my first time. I often came home to find a note on the kitchen counter saying they'd gone to Florida for a few days and that there were groceries in the fridge. Since the divorce, she was regularly leaving me alone for long periods of time to go to Florida. We lived on a relatively quiet road surrounded by trees and set a few miles outside of town. And I knew most of the people, if not by name, then by face enough to wave and make small chat with. And never before had been given a reason to be afraid of being all by myself. On the night in question, 
I was staying up late watching television and had most of the lights on in the house. Not because I was afraid, but because at 13, I wasn't concerned with electricity bills or saving the environment. I felt completely safe and protected within my bubble of a home. As I was watching the movie, I kept hearing these weird sounds outside, but I remember thinking it was probably the neighbors. Though they weren't extremely close, a couple of them were having a party or people over for the holiday. About halfway into the movie, however, the power in the house suddenly went out. I sat on the couch for a minute, just sort of in a panic daze, because it was near midnight and now pitch black. I remember thinking the power must have gone out and that it would come back on, so I decided to sit on the couch with my blanket and just wait. A few minutes passed by when I heard a noise in the kitchen where the back door is. My heart started racing in my chest because I thought it sounded like the back door being shut. The back door sits just off the dining room, which is connected to the kitchen, which leads directly into the living room where I was currently sitting on the couch. A few seconds passed after I heard that sound, and I was straining my ears to pick up anything that wasn't supposed to be there. Every noise suddenly felt magnified. When footsteps sounded on the floor, I immediately slithered off the couch onto all fours, crawled around the ottoman, and started as slowly and as quietly as I could to make my way toward the space between the love seat and the couch. I knew I could fit under the side table and be completely hidden by the dark and the ottoman from playing hide and go seek in the dark many, many times with my friends during sleepovers. I was nearly there when the footsteps became more apparent. I knew from the sound of them that whoever it was was making their way through the kitchen now toward the living room. They weren't hurried or anything, it was like they were just moving around in the kitchen. I glanced up from where I was crouched on the floor, and to my horror, there was a dark silhouette standing in the archway between the two rooms. To my credit, I didn't scream. However, I did panic. I stood immediately to my feet from my hiding spot and ran down the hallway. And I believe the only reason I wasn't overcome was because the person chasing me had to get around the ottoman in the dark to follow me. I did what all children do when they're afraid, and I bypassed the front door, the guest bedroom, the bathroom, and ran to the furthest door down the hallway, my room. In all honesty, I probably wouldn't have been able to get to the front door and unlock it in time, as it was right off the side of the couch. When I was 10, I got a bird for my birthday. He was a blue-fronted Amazon, and I named him Boo, because it was October and so close to Halloween. Boo had a large iron cage and it felt like it was like six feet tall, and it was kept in my room, despite the fact that Boo, like me, pretty much had the run of the house wherever he wanted. This information will become relevant later on in the story. As I ran into the room, I slammed the door shut and locked it. However, the lock was simply one of those little turn knobs that you can easily pop with a butter knife. I had barely gotten the door shut and locked it when the person on the other side knocked on it. I have no idea why they knocked. If they did it to mock me or scare me, but I knew in my heart that my little lock was not going to keep whoever it was on the other side out of my room. It didn't keep my mother out when we were arguing, and it wouldn't stand up to brute force. I was panicking and on the verge of tears when the person started laughing. It was low, quiet, and because of that, it was even more frightening. It wasn't like manic laughter but as if they were genuinely amused. It was the laughter that really frightened me. I started heavily, hysterically crying and looking around my room to figure out what I could do. That was when I realized Boo's cage would almost fit perfectly between the door and the wall of my closet. The cage moved quietly on my carpeted floor, but as I pushed it into place, it scraped against the door and alerted whoever it was on the other side that I was trying to barricade myself in. Because, suddenly, they threw themselves at the door, and you could hear the sound of the wood splintering and the door handle being twisted violently. Boo, who had been stirred by the movement, began literally screaming and flapping his wings. I might have screamed with him, but honestly, I don't remember screaming. I just remember being extremely scared. Terrified. I crawled under my bed and waited. Several minutes passed. And the person eventually stopped attacking my door. Boo continued screaming even after he had stopped. Though being under my bed 
gave me no feelings of being secure. I didn't come out from under it because I simply had nowhere else to go. I thought about trying to go out the window, but I felt and I was afraid he might expect that and therefore be waiting for me on the other side. It was also several feet off the ground as the house was built on a raised foundation. I remember laying underneath my bed, terrified for what felt like hours. I must have fallen asleep because I woke the next morning to daylight. The fear of what happened came back to me as soon as I registered where I was and why. Scared that whoever had been in my house that night might still be there. I decided to crawl out the window and run to a neighbor's since it was daylight outside now. And therefore, I felt less afraid. Crawling out of a window is a lot harder than it looks, and I did it less than gracefully, as I was not, and still am not, the most coordinated human being. Once I was back on my feet, however, carefully made my way around the house, and that's when I noticed that the back door was wide open. Scared, but feeling braver now that I was outside and it was morning, instead of a pitch black night, I walked up the back steps and peered inside. Seeing nothing out of the ordinary, I decided to go back in. Looking back, I cringe on how stupid this could have turned out, and that I wish I could tell my younger self to make the smarter move and just go get help. But thankfully, no one was inside the house. I did a terrifying, heart-pounding room-to-room check, looking in closets and under beds, behind the couch, anywhere I thought even a small child might even be able to fit. I even popped the lock off my mom's bedroom so I could check, and then relocked it afterwards. When I was positive there was no one there, I went back to lock the back door and noticed that the breaker box on the opposite wall was open. The main switch had been pulled. I flipped it back on, locked both locks on the back door, checked all the windows and front door, and then called my mom, where I once again broke down crying hysterically. She called a coworker who came and stayed the entire day with me as they drove back. My mom still took random trips to Florida after that, but I always went with her from then on forward. So, terrifying, laughing, crazy person that broke into my house on New Year's Eve, please, let's never meet again. I sincerely hope no other young girl had to meet you either. I don't know if you were just some drunk visitor of a neighbor, but you terrorized me that night. I was afraid of being alone when my mom was working, and still to this day, I get scared when I'm home alone, and overthink what I would do if someone came inside, and where I would hide. When my cats make noise out of nowhere, I immediately investigate for fear it's someone trying to get in. The Blue Hole is a 100 meter deep sinkhole on the coast of the Red Sea, five miles north of Dahab, Egypt. Its nickname is the Diver Cemetery. Divers in that area have claimed that 200 have died in recent years. Many of those who died were attempting to swim under the arch. Many certified scuba divers think that they're capable of just going a little deeper, but they don't know that there are special gas mixtures, buoyancy equipment, and training required for just a few meters of depth. Imagine this. You take your PADI open water diving course and you learn your dive charts. You buy your own gear and become familiar with it. Compared to the average person on the street, you're an expert now. You go diving on coral reefs, a few shipwrecks, and even catch lobster in New England. You go to visit a deep spot like this and you're having a great time. You see something just in front of you, this beautiful cave with sunlight streaming through. You decide to swim just a little closer. You're not going to go inside it, you know better than that, but you just want to take a closer look. If your dive computer starts beeping, you'll head back up. You swim a little closer, it's breathtaking. You're enjoying the view, just floating there, taking it all in. You hear a clanging sound. It's your dive master wrapping the butt of his knife on his tank to get someone's attention. You look up to see what he wants, but after staring into darkness for the last minute, the sunlight streaming down is blinding you. You turn away to reach to check your dive computer. It's a little awkward for some reason, and you twist your shoulder and pull it towards you. It's beeping, and the screen is flashing, go up, 
You stare at it for a few seconds, trying to make out the depth and the tank level between the flashing words. The numbers won't stay still. It's really annoying and your brain isn't getting the info you want at a glance. So you let it fall back to your left shoulder, turn towards the light, and head up. The problem is the blue hole is bigger than anything you've ever dove before, and the crystal clear water provides a visibility that is ten times what you're used to in the dark waters of St. Loris, where you usually dive. What you don't realize is that when you swam down a little further just to get a closer look, thinking it was only 30 or 40 feet more, you actually swam almost twice that because the vast scale of things have been messed up in your sense of distance. And while you were looking at the archway, you didn't have any nearby point of reference in your vision. More depth equals more pressure. And your BCD, the air-filled jacket that you used to control your buoyancy, was compressed a little. You were slowly sinking and had no idea. That's when the dive master began banging his tank when you looked up. This only served to blind you for a moment and distract your sense of motion and position even more. Your dive computer wasn't sticking out on your chest just below your shoulder when you reached for it because your BCD was shrinking. You turned your body sideways while twisting and reaching for it. The 10 seconds spent fumbling for it and staring at the screen brought you deeper and you began to accelerate with your jacket continuing to shrink. The reason that you didn't hear the beeping at first, and that it took so long to make out the depth between the flashing words, was the nitrogen narcosis. You've been getting depth drunk, and the numbers wouldn't stay still because you were still sinking. You swam towards the light, but the current is pulling you sideways. Your brain is hurting, straining for no reason. And the blue hole seems like it's gotten narrower and the light rays above you are going at a funny angle. You kick harder just to keep going up, toward the light. Despite this damn current that wants to push you into the wall, your computer is beeping incessantly, and it feels like you're swimming through mud. Fuck this. You grab the fill button on your jacket and squeeze it. You're not supposed to use your jacket to ascend. As you know, that will expand as the pressure drops, and you will need to carefully bleed off air to avoid shooting up to the surface. But you don't care about that anymore. Shooting up to the surface is exactly what you want right now, and you'll deal with bleeding air off and making depth stops when you're back up with the rest of the group. The sound of air rushing into your BCD fills your ears, but nothing's happening. Something doesn't sound right, like the air isn't filling fast enough. You look down at your jacket, searching for whatever the trouble might be when flunk, you bump right into the side of a giant sinkhole. What the hell? Why is the current pulling me sideways? Why is there even a current in an empty hole in the middle of the ocean? You keep holding the button. Inflate, damn it, inflate! Your computer is now making a frantically screeching sound you've never heard before. You notice that you've been breathing heavily. It's a sign of stress. The sound of air rushing into your jacket is getting weaker. Every 10 meters of water adds one atmosphere of pressure. Your tank has enough air for you to spend an hour at 10 meters and to refill your BCD more than 100 times. Each additional 20 meters of depth cuts this time in half. This assumes that you are calm, controlling your breathing and using your muscles slowly with intention. If you panic, begin breathing quickly and more rapidly. This cuts your time in half. You're certified to 20 meters, and you've gone briefly down to 30 meters on some shipwrecks before. So you were comfortable swimming to 25 meters to look at the arch. While you were looking at it, you sank to 40 meters. And while you messed up looking around at your dive master and then the computer, you sank to 60 meters. At 6 atmospheres of pressure. You only have 10 minutes of air at this depth. When you swam for the surface, you'd become disoriented from twisting around. And then looking at your gear, you were now right in front of the archway. You swam into the archway, thinking it was the surface. That's why the blue hole looks smaller now. There is no current pulling you sideways. You are continuing to sink to the bottom of the arch. When you hit the bottom and started to inflate your BCD, you are now over 90 meters. You will go through a full tank of air in only a couple of minutes at this depth. Panicking like this, 
you're down to seconds. There's only enough air to inflate your BCD, but it will take over a minute to fill. And it doesn't matter, because that would only pull you up into the top of the arch, and you will drown before you get there, holding the inflate button as you kick as hard as you can for the light. Your muscles are screaming. Your brain is screaming. It's getting harder and harder to suck each panic breath out of your regulator. A final fit of rage and frustration. You scream into your useless reg. Darkness squeezing into every corner of your vision. Four minutes. That's how long your dive lasted. You died in clear water on a sunny day in only four minutes. People laugh at me when I tell them this story, but to me, it was extremely scary and sad. This happened in January 2018. I was still living in beautiful Hawaii with my infant daughter and my husband. We woke up from the sun shining on us through the window, and we were talking about going to the beach. We were all three of us just laying in bed, looking at our phones. I remember searching on Yelp for the best Akai Bowl to get in Hawaii, and then all of a sudden my phone vibrated and I received a government alert. Emergency alert. Ballistic missile threat inbound to Hawaii. Seek immediate shelter. This is not a drill. That's the exact message I received and froze. My husband, who was a tough infantry soldier, just went, What the? And looked at me. I'm not sure how my face looked, but I was terrified. I had read threats about North Korea for a couple of months now, so I wasn't completely surprised. I just couldn't believe that this was actually happening. At the time of this, we were living in military housing. Wheeler, which is right next to Schofield Barracks. I know Wheeler got hit the day Pearl Harbor was attacked. And it was being next to the army base solidified the fact to me that whoever sent the missile would obviously aim for us. Clearly, I did and still do not know much about missiles and bombs and how they're sent off. But all I could think was that my little baby and our dog and I were about to die. My husband instructed me to hide in the bathroom. So I grabbed water bottles, my baby, and our sweet dog, put a blanket in the bathtub, and sat down holding the baby and hugging our dog. I was shaking and crying and managed to send a few messages out. I whatsapped my mom, who lives in Europe, and my dad, who lives in Guam, told them I love them and that I'm going to die. I felt so horrible because my older brother passed away, and I could not imagine putting them through that pain once again. As many mothers would do, mine immediately called and started crying. My husband, who is normally a huge talker, was actually quiet and sent his goodbye messages to people. Time stood still, and I just kept praying and promising that if I were to survive this, I would become a better person. I had been dealing with horrible postpartum depression, which made me question my right to live. But those 20 minutes really made me realize how quickly everything could be gone and over. After what seemed like forever, we received another alert. I have never felt so much relief in my life than when that message came in and this whole alert was an accident. We were told later that a government employee fell asleep and fell on a button that sent out alerts. I still don't buy it, but I don't care. All I care about is that my family and I are alive. I'm not sure why I remember this day so well, but it turned out to be a beautiful day. Obviously, the whole island was talking about this, and it created a bunch of chaos. I feel like everyone was nicer than usual. I went for a long walk with my baby and dog, and appreciated my life, the sun, the gorgeous scenery, and even my struggles. Later on, we went to the beach with some family, and had a beautiful rest of the day. This is a story I heard from a guy who used to be our driver back in the day. I can't vouch for its authenticity, as I wasn't there, but it's one hell of a story nonetheless. So this guy, Lakpa, was returning to Darjeeling after dropping a passenger to Siliguri. Though the total distance is only 70 kilometers, the journey usually would take 3-4 to four hours due to the majority of the road being in hilly terrain. Let me give you a brief explanation of the route. There are many smaller towns that fall between Siliguri and Darjeeling, with the largest one being Kyrsong. Kyrsong is situated approximately halfway between Siliguri and Darjeeling, 
If you want to travel from Siliguri to Darjeeling or vice versa, you have to go through Kyrsong, unless you want to take a longer route. There are three roads connecting these three, PB Road, the Hillcart Road, and the Rohini Road. This incident happened in the 1980s, so the Rohini Road hadn't been constructed yet. The PB Road, which is very isolated to this date, wasn't considered safe at the time, especially after dark. So he was on Hillcart Road. After driving for around 40 minutes, he reached a small town called Tinharia. This was around 10.30 p.m. He noticed an average looking young woman in casual clothes, standing alone on the side of the road. She appeared to be hitchhiking, so he offered her a ride. She thanked him and sat shotgun. She told him that she lived with her parents and brother in a small town somewhere between Kyrsong and Darjeeling and had been invited to a birthday party of one of her friends living in Tenharia. She had lost track of time during the celebration, and by the time she decided to leave, the last taxi for the day had already left. Her friends had asked to spend the night and just leave in the morning, but she declined their offer, explaining that her parents would be upset if she stayed. The story seemed innocent enough, so Lakpa wasn't in the least suspicious. They chatted happily and soon reached Kursong around 11 p.m., Drivers generally halt at Kyrsong for refreshments and a bit of rest, but that day, Lakpa was forced to drive on as all the shops had already shut, owning to the lateness of the hour. The journey continued, and they finally reached the woman's destination at around midnight. The woman pointed at a plain-looking two-storied house with the front lawn standing independently on the edge of town. He also didn't find this suspicious, as it's not uncommon to see such houses in this area. She thanked him and offered to pay for the ride but he declined and was about to leave when the woman asked if he would like to spend the night at her house. As he was pretty exhausted from all the driving, he was tempted to take her offer, but he was hesitant as he thought he would be imposing. However, on her insistence, he finally agreed. After parking his car on the side of the road, he followed her into the house. The main door was unlocked, and she explained that her parents had left it open for her. As she let him in, she told him to be quiet so her family wouldn't be disturbed. She soon took him to a room on the ground floor and showed him the accommodations. There was no bed, but a mattress was rolled up in the corner. After helping him roll out the mattress and providing pillows, blankets, and covers, she pointed at a hook on the wall where he would be able to hang his clothes. She then bid him good night and left for her own room, which was on the first floor. Lakpa, after hanging his jacket on the hook, drifted off as soon as his head hit the pillows, as he was completely exhausted. The next morning, he sensed a bright light even before his eyes opened, and he could feel a chilly breeze that made him shiver. As he opened his eyes, he was astonished to see that he was lying under open sky, on the ground, in the middle of a meadow of sorts. He felt confused and disoriented before he recalled what had transpired the night before. As he got up in bewilderment, he noticed that he was laying in the middle of a graveyard. And to his horror, he realized that he'd been sleeping on someone's grave, with his jacket hanging off the tombstone. He bolted towards his car, which was parked near the graveyard, started the engine, and drove away as fast as he could. Mar does ma. It's a monster that feeds on one thing. Fear. I am very happy to say that I personally have had no encounters with it, but the stories that you might hear about it are usually told by people who are not liars. Allow me to explain what it is, first with some history. I live in Iran, specifically the province of eastern Azerbaijan. If you look up what is called the Iranian Plateau, or the Iranian cultural continent, or Greater Iran, you'll find Iran and a bunch of her neighboring countries. In this area, different branches of Iranian languages are spoken, and with similar cultures comes similar mythology, and with that comes shared monsters. Originally, we believed in monsters called Deves. They are creations of Ahriman, the devil. Deves are a mortal enemy to the human race, like demons in Western culture. 
Imagine ghouls with the strength to lift a mountain, with claws and teeth like daggers, and impenetrable skin. If that's not overpowered enough, they're also said to be very smart, capable of using black magic to do things like taking different forms. There are famous deeves, such as Cheshmuk, who is responsible for earthquakes and hurricanes. Some appear in Shah Nameh, the Book of Ancient Iranian Legends, such as the White Deev, who imprisoned the Shah of Iran and was defeated by a warrior from Sistan. After the Muslim conquest and conversion to Islam, people kept their culture, but the Deves were now called by an Islamic name, Jinn. Mar Desma is a Deev. Of course, that means some might call it Jinn. The word Mar Dasma in Persian and other Iranian languages means man-tester or man-challenger. It may be pronounced a bit differently in various parts. Mar Desma, Mart Asma, some might call it Javan Asma, meaning young tester or even jinn. But they all refer to the same thing, a div which can take different forms, even the forms of your loved ones. It can mimic the sounds of your loved ones and do anything it can to draw you into graveyards or forests or dark alleys and dark corners at night. When it takes the form of an animal or human, it looks completely natural. It feeds on fear and, oddly enough, never attacks timid people. It likes to scare brave souls. That's why it is called Challenger. Mar Dosma uses various ways and tactics. Sometimes it takes the forms of innocent-looking farm animals, such as sheep, goats, or dogs, and approaches lone people in the dark. Then it suddenly speaks or changes forms. Sometimes it might approach a lonely traveler or stranger. Sometimes you hear someone that you know calling you, trying to draw you into the woods or dark caves or something of the sort. If you go in, though, it will scare you to death. You might have a heart attack, so yeah, it can kill people. There are times it might appear as a thin and skinny-looking creature, but as you want to investigate what it is exactly, it will start to rapidly grow taller and taller into a gigantic monster right from your nightmares. Maybe one night you're getting home late. A head comes out of a dark corner. Maybe the face looks like your neighbor. But as you want to say hello, the face begins to change, the more you look, the uglier and scarier it becomes, until either you look away and run or continue watching the show and die of sheer terror. The Challenger always invents new ways to scare people, and usually it doesn't want to kill you, it just wants you to be scared. But there is one thing that will make it angry, so angry, in fact, that it will not hesitate to tear you apart. Never tell Mar does Ma that you are not scared of it. Never challenge the challenger. Some believe that if you become friends with a Mar does Ma, it can tell you the places of lost objects, or give you life advice, or tell you something from the future. But I wouldn't risk it. My apologies for the long introduction. Just keep in mind that Mar does Ma only challenges the brave. So if you're a scaredy cat like me, there is no need to worry. Here are the stories. The first two I heard from people that I trust, and the last one is a famous story told around here, so take it with a grain of salt. Number one, the floating man. This story is from an old man in my village in eastern Azerbaijan, Iran. Our main product is apples. It happened in a trail around our village. During the day, it's gorgeous, but at night, it can be a very scary place. I will share the story from his point of view. I was younger, you see. Our watering schedule at the apple farm was set up so that each garden would have a few hours of water. My shift at the gardens began in the middle of the night so I would have to wake up, pick up my shovel, then go to the gardens to water the apple trees. It was an hour-long walk, and it went right through the graveyard, then along through other people's gardens. I know what you're thinking, but no, it didn't happen in the graveyard. 
The night in question, I was able to pass through the graveyard without any trouble. I then entered the part of the path that was surrounded by trees. These trees formed a thick wall along the shoulders of the road. Here, all you can see are the stars above and the road lit by the moonlight below you. I soon arrived at the spot where there are some big rocks on the ground. I was looking down to watch my steps so that I didn't trip over one. It was then that I felt a presence above me. It was like I felt a shadow of fear lay over me. Hesitantly, I looked up. Between two of the trees, I saw this tall man floating above me. He had his hands completely open. Imagine someone floating in a pool with their front side and face in the water. And imagine you're under the water below them, sitting at the bottom, and they're staring right at you. That's what it was like. I was terrified when I saw his face. His eyes were big and wide open, almost popping out of their sockets. And his teeth. I wasn't sure if he was smiling or baring his teeth at me, or if he just didn't have lips at all. But I knew those teeth did not look natural for a human. I whimpered, What are you? And it spoke to me. I am. But I didn't really want to stay there and hear what else it had to say. I quickly dropped my shovel and began to run with all the power I could summon in my legs. I'm not sure if it followed me or not, because I never did look back. I stopped only when I was back in the village on my doorstep. Even in the morning, I didn't dare go retrieve my shovel. I'm not sure what it was, and I was not going to stay there to hear the answer to my question. Number 2. The Sheep This story was told to me by a friend of mine. It happened to his great uncle in their village in Luristan. This story will be told from his point of view. I was in my twenties. One late, dark evening, I was on my way home, casually passing through the empty alleys when I saw this sheep at a small dead end. It was too late for sheep to be outside, unaccompanied and awake, so I thought it was a runaway. As I was watching it, I got a clearer look at it. It was a beautiful and healthy sheep, it looked to be a good breed, and I was very tempted to take it home myself. I was young and strong, so I just lifted it up and put it on my shoulders, and I kept walking. After a couple of steps, I remembered to check if it was a male or female, so I felt over between its legs. Now, as I'm just about to find out, the sheep brings its mouth closer to my left ear, and I hear it speak to me. You know... I am way older than your grandfather. Freaking out, I dropped the sheep. But when I looked back, it disappeared. It had just vanished like it was never there. When I arrived home, I told the story to my family, who said it was probably a djinn. Number 3. The Story of Palavan Abbas Palavan Abbas was a man in a small village named Tarmistan in Zagros Mountains. Palavan means champion, because he was a wrestler, and Abbas was his name. Aside from wrestling, his main occupation was pottery. He had a student named Kasim, who was going to learn his art. Kasim's father had passed away and he lived with his old mother, so Palavan Abbas had told Kasim that if there was any problem, he could ask him for help. One night, there was a knocking at Palavan's door. It was Kasim saying, Please hurry, Palavan. My mother is sick and I need your help to get her to a doctor. Now, Kasim seemed to be speaking with a different tone and accent than usual. But Palavan immediately got dressed and told Kasim to lead the way. After a while, it became clear that they were not on the right path to Kasim's house. Kasim was leading him outside of town. Kasim, where are we going? asked Palavan. Kasim just turned and smiled at him with yellow teeth. Weird, he thought. 
They climbed a hill, and Kasim said, We're here. So where's your mom, Kasim? As Kasim turned, Palavan saw that it wasn't Kasim at all. What he was now looking at was a hideous, three-meter-high creature with a humanoid body and the face of a dog. What are you? said Palavan. The creature replied, I am Mardasma. Are you scared? No, a champion fears nothing, replied Palavan. Well, then you must wrestle with me. If you lose, I will take your life, said the creature. And so they wrestled, fighting for hours, and near the morning, Palavan managed to win. As the monster's back touched the ground, it turned into dust and smoke. With many bruises and a lot of pain, Palavan went back to the village, to the real Kasim, where he told the others what had happened to him before dying from exhaustion. This is an update to the original set of stories about Mar Dasma. Since writing that previous post, I spoke to a distant cousin of mine who recalled an adventure we had as kids, something I had forgotten about. Although this is technically one story, I think it would be best to break it into two. Number four. Behind the window. I was staying at my parents' house. They told me I could sleep in the room upstairs. That room was pretty big, it had a lot of stuff and junk in it, kind of like the old attics in movies. There was a window in there, maybe about two meters by two meters, with thick curtains, and right under it was my bed. From the very start, I got a bad feeling about that window, but I just shrugged it off. At about 9 p.m., it started. Bang! It was like a muscular man had punched the glass as hard as he could. It was even more terrifying because I couldn't see outside. The curtains were too thick. Quickly, I ran downstairs in a panic, telling my grandmother, Oh, don't worry. We didn't hear anything. It probably was just some bird or bat attracted to the light of your room. Just turn the light off and go to bed, honey. So I did. Around midnight, though, I was awakened by, you guessed it, another bang. This time, I was in the bed, so it was only inches from my face. I tried to calm myself down, to go back to sleep, but around 3 a.m. it came again, this time much harder. It felt as if something was hiding on the other side of that window, just about to break through and take me away. I couldn't see anything and I was way too scared to open the curtain and peek outside. The pure silence was killing me now, not a single cricket or dog barking. Slowly, I crawled out of bed, quietly making my way downstairs to my grandparents. All the while, I felt hunted by something. Once I got down there, I just slept on a blanket on the floor. It wasn't comfy at all, but... At least it felt safe. The following night, I tried once again to sleep in that very same room in the very same bed. But the large window with the thick curtains never did have that haunting feeling again. I would even go on to sleep there many times throughout the years, and I never had any more supposed bats or birds banging on the window. Nowadays, I think it may have been Mar Desma trying to scare me. I don't think bats would all of a sudden feel like going kamikaze on me like that. Number 5. The Brog This always gave me the goosebumps. Back when we were kids, Kay, my cousin, and I would play together, going on adventures, discovering things, and so on. One summer, we were entrusted with the responsibility to herd a dozen cattle. We would gather them in the morning, take them out into the fields, start a fire, and cook lunch as they ate. 
We would take them then to a river, or somewhere with water, to drink. Then we would take them back to the village in the evening. Now keep in mind, this happened in the exact same trail as the story, The Floating Man, that I told before. The night before, we had read a made-up story, a creepypasta, if you will, about a monster called Brog, who haunted a road in another country. I've forgotten which country that was. Now, we knew it wasn't real, and even if it was, it was in some other part of the world and could never get us. In this story, the Brog kind of looked like a werewolf. It was said that he would first feel hunted or stalked, then suddenly all the birds in the area would flee away. You would then begin to hear footsteps behind you, and they would get closer as if they are walking inches behind you. Then you would hear the breathing. Not long after that, you would hear a massive, terrifying roar. By the time you turned around to see your stalker, you would see nothing more than a pair of red eyes, and the following morning, they would find your cold, dead body. Your skin turned black as coal, and that was when we got too spooked to read the rest. The next morning, we decided to make our way through, you guessed it, the trail. In the morning, it was truly beautiful. As the evening approached, it took a bit longer than we liked to gather our things and the cows. In the dark, we were walking along the trail with the cows in front of us. Now, at the time, we had not heard the story of the floating man, so we weren't scared at all of the trail ahead. But that was about to change. One by one, the signs of Brog started to come to life for us. First, that sudden and ominous feeling of being stalked. Second, the birds all around the valley suddenly getting spooked all at once and flying away. Third, the footsteps getting closer and closer to us. We tried to walk, not run, faster and faster. Suddenly, the bushes behind us began to make noises, as if something was running through them and shaking them. I said to my cousin, Hey, why don't you take a look to see what's behind us? Dude, I I'm as scared as you are. I I'm not looking back, he said. We were sure that this was it that we wouldn't see the light of tomorrow. But as we made it to the graveyard, suddenly things changed, as if something heavy was lifted from our hearts. We found the courage to look back. What was following us was just a dog, and it just turned back and ran into the wilderness. Later that night, we decided to read the rest of the Brog story. A certain part made our hearts churn in our chests, Brog can show itself as a dog. All these years later, I would shrug off the Brog adventure as us being kids, but now I think that something knew exactly and specifically what we were scared of, then presented itself in that way. There are other stories about that trail. I once heard someone say they saw something that would be best described as a mix between Yoda from Star Wars and a monkey along that same trail at night. I found a big similarity in all of them. The graveyard is safe, and the Mar Dasma will not follow you there. My cousin believes that may be because there are good people buried there. Hey everyone, thanks for listening if you stuck around at this point. If you haven't yet, please hit the like button, the subscribe button, and that notification bell to be notified when future episodes come out. If you have a true scary story of your own, feel free to send it to my email or post it to my subreddit. You can stalk me on Twitter, you can stalk me on Instagram, and you can also stalk me on Facebook. All these links are below. What's going on guys? This is a nice big long one. Um, hope you like that. This is definitely one of the, one of my favorite episodes I've made thus far. The thumbnail I made for this one is one of my favorite ones I've made thus far. Um, I don't know. This one's just good. Feels good. Um, and also, I got to feature a really red, really red, 
really rad dude uh darkness prevails i've worked with him a few times in the past and this is the first time he's been featured on my channel he's one of the greats he's one of the big boys out there that's been doing this for a very long time has his own podcasts has his own channel has his own podcasting network does a lot of rad shit so i highly doubt you haven't heard him by now but if for some reason you haven't please do go check him out i'll leave the link to at least his youtube and all that stuff below he's got a insane amount of other content all across other platforms so definitely go check that out so it was honor and it was pretty rad to feature him again today so hope you like that um i uh, uh i don't know i need to do a bunch of stuff around the house today kind of need to clean up do catch up on some stuff um look into schools and stuff again to been putting that off and then i also need to finally work on my episode for the horrid channel the true crime channel that i'm going to be putting out that i have but i haven't yet to put anything out so i have an episode i have the stories recorded i just need to edit them and then edit all the footage and put all that stuff together so i promise next week that will be out for anybody wondering like what the hell are you going to do anything with this channel i've been putting all of my irons that i have into the fire with this channel i've been putting all my time and stuff into it so horrid will be up and running next week or at least the first episode will be so i'm stoked for that i'm excited for that i hope you are too and i will see you guys in the next one i should have another themed episode monday for this channel so look out for that and i will see you in that one chicka chicka yeah fake id fake id yeah 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 all right i love you Cheers, toodaloo, adios, see you next time, au revoir, later on, TTYL, my phone just went off, get to enjoy that, not editing, oh, it's going off again, enjoy that as well, ooh, ooh, yeah, okay, you're all done listening, and I'm done editing, enjoy, and always remember to flick it, bop it, Pull it. Doom, 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 doom.